Hi, this is Michael Altos. We're continuing our discussion of local anesthetics. This is recording part two. Let's take a step back now and look at pharmacokinetics as it applies to local anesthetics. These drugs are rapidly absorbed through mucous membranes, like the conjunctiva of the eye, the lining of the trachea or the oropharynx, but they are very poorly absorbed through intact skin. One example of what needs to be done to get these to work through the skin is Emla cream, which you may see in pediatrics, and it needs to be applied with an hour's advance notice. You need a pretty thick layer. Usually you cover it with some sort of occlusive dressing. It only penetrates about three to five millimeters into the skin, and if you give too much of it, you run the risk of developing methemoglobinemia, which we'll discuss a little bit later. So usually when we give local anesthetics, um, either we're putting them on mucous membranes or we are injecting them or applying them to some tissue. Local anesthetics can be injected in one place, but they can be absorbed into the systemic circulation. And the more vascular the area of the body is, the more uptake into the systemic circulation we'll see. So obviously giving it into an IV is the most systemic of all. After that, the trachea and intercostal injections tend to be very vascular. After that, caudal or epidural injections, then peripheral nerve blocks, and finally subcutaneous injection will have the least vascularity and therefore the least risk of systemic absorption. One thing that we do to decrease systemic absorption is we can cause vasoconstriction. And for that reason, we often mix our local anesthetics with epinephrine. This has a few um, benefits. First of all, it increases uptake of the anesthetic into the nerve because vasoconstriction limits the blood flow to that area. We get decreased redistribution away from the nerve, so the local anesthetic sits in that spot longer, again because there isn't much blood flow to that area due to the vasoconstriction. Some say that there isn't as much vasoconstriction with bupivacaine, um, maybe because it's protein bound. Classically, they have said you shouldn't use epinephrine when you are injecting local anesthetic in a terminal part of the body because of the decreased blood supply. The, the rhyme has always been fingers, toes, penis, and nose. There isn't actually a lot of evidence, and there are some practitioners who do use epinephrine when anesthetizing these areas, but we should be careful to make sure there is adequate blood flow and we don't cause too much vasoconstriction. By the way, there is one local anesthetic that causes vasoconstriction without epinephrine, and that is cocaine, which we'll discuss shortly. What makes these local anesthetics stop working? Well, they need to diffuse away from their site of action and get into the systemic circulation. Once they do, the ester local anesthetics, the esters are commonly chloroprocaine, novocaine, tetracaine, benzocaine, these are all metabolized by pseudocholinesterase, the same pseudocholinesterase that succinylcholine is metabolized by, and then they're excreted in the urine. There's no pseudocholinesterase in the CSF, which is why you can use tetracaine as a spinal, for example, or chloroprocaine. As part of the metabolic process, we form PABA, para-aminobenzoic acid, and this substance can precipitate allergic reaction in some people. Cocaine is an ester but it's also partially metabolized in the liver. So these are the esters. Then we have the amides, lidocaine, bupivacaine, ropivacaine, mipivacaine, prilocaine. All of these generic names have two letter I in them. So that's one way people remember the amides versus the esters, but it only works for the generic names, not for the brand name like marcaine. The amides are all metabolized in the liver. And for that reason, they tend to have a much slower uh, metabolism, a much longer duration of action than the esters. One type of local anesthetic worth mentioning is something called liposomal bupivacaine, which is sold under the brand name Exparel. This is bupivacaine, but it's designed to provide sustained release of encapsulated bupivacaine after a single administration, and it has been used for local infiltration of surgical wounds as well as for various types of peripheral nerve blocks. The goal, of course, is to reduce pain um, and increase the amount of time until patients first require rescue opioid medications for pain control. 
and overall less rescue analgesia by having this prolonged release of local anesthetic. Studies have not been very conclusive that this is an effective treatment. Uh, there have not been studies that show statistic statistically significant differences compared with doing the same procedures with just plain bupivacaine, bupivacaine, and block duration has been very modestly extended by something around 14%. In addition, there have been some reports of increased risk of tissue inflammation or myotoxicity. Uh, some people have reported increased risks of local anesthetic toxicity, although I have not seen that data myself. And the other thing to keep in mind is that Expirel is quite expensive compared to regular plain bupivacaine. So you may see this drug being used by surgeons or by members of the anesthesia care team, and it's something you should be aware of. What are the effects of local anesthetics on the organ systems? So in the central nervous system, we concern ourselves with toxicity. Toxicity would be any time we get a large amount of local anesthetic into the brain. CNS toxicity usually occurs prior to cardiotoxicity, but this is not 100% reliable. Early signs might be numbness of the tongue or in the circumoral region. Patients may have dizziness, tinnitus, blurred vision, or a metallic taste in their mouth. With increasing doses, they'll have restlessness, agitation, nervousness, slurred speech, drowsiness, and eventually loss of consciousness, progressing ultimately to muscle twitching and seizures. The seizures should be treated with benzodiazepines. You could use thiopental or propofol, but we worry about hypotension and apnea. We know that lidocaine can decrease cerebral blood flow and minimize the elevation in ICP that we get with intubation. So this is one of the reasons we often give lidocaine as part of our induction cocktail. In fact, a lidocaine infusion can decrease MAC by about 40%. Also on the topic of CNS, we have cocaine, which has many CNS effects, including euphoria, restlessness, and then progressing to tremors, convulsions, and respiratory failure. A few um, side effects that you may not see very often, but you should be aware of them. One is intrathecal chloroprocaine, so a spinal with chloroprocaine, has been reported to cause what they, what they termed a prolonged neurologic effect. And this was probably due to a preservative that was in it called sodium bisulfate. And now we have preservative-free preservative chloroprocaine. There are centers that routinely use chloroprocaine for short procedures done under spinal anesthesia. Secondly, we saw that repeated doses of intrathecal lidocaine or tetracaine caused cauda equina syndrome. And so we want to avoid repeated doses or infusions if you won't see too many people using spinal catheters anymore, but that used to be more popular. So that would want to be, you would want to avoid that with lidocaine or tetracaine because of this risk of cauda equina syndrome. Finally, there's the TNS, transient neurologic symptoms. And this occurred when people would get a spinal with 5% lidocaine. Again, not a, a practice that you will see very often anymore. Patients would get this pain in their buttocks. It could be anywhere from slight to severe. It would radiate into their legs and it would happen starting about 24 hours after anesthesia and last up to 10 days. There usually wasn't any permanent damage, but obviously this is a pretty significant side effect. So that's all neurologic side effects. Next, we should talk about cardiovascular side effects. Since local anesthetics bind to sodium channels, they can have an effect on the conduction of the heart. And in fact, we see depressed contractility, automaticity, and conduction velocity. In fact, that's why we use IV lidocaine to treat ventricular arrhythmias, because it slows down conduction in the heart and helps break some of those ventricular arrhythmias. Lidocaine can also help smooth muscles relax, which causes some hypotension. At high doses, local anesthetics will lead to cardiac arrest. And the treatment is ACLS, impressors if needed, Obviously, we want to avoid lidocaine, even though the patient may be in some sort of a ventricular arrhythmia. Uh, 
and it's recommended to limit epinephrine. A mainstay of treatment for local anesthetic toxicity is intralipid, the same stuff that propofol is dissolved in, and it's also used in IV nutrition for critically ill patients or patients who can't take any food by mouth for a long time. Intralipid infusions have been shown to reverse cardiotoxicity. If these don't work, patients may need to go on cardiopulmonary bypass. And that's especially true for IV bupivacaine, which really blocks those cardiac sodium channels very tightly, and they are very difficult to resuscitate and may take hours before the bupivacaine um, is metabolized. We can also see some vasodilation and inhibition of sympathetic reflexes. And for this reason, some people prefer not to use large volumes of IV bupivacaine or of bupivacaine at all. And instead, they use levobupivacaine or ropivacaine, which have a much wider therapeutic index. This graph here demonstrates the differences between bupivacaine and the safer L-bupivacaine and ropivacaine. Here we are looking at how much serum concentration do you need before the patient has convulsions. You can see you need a much higher concentration for any of the, the bupivacaine, the L-bupivacaine or the ropivacaine compared to regular bupivacaine. That's true for convulsions, hypotension, apnea, and circulatory collapse. And what we can also see is that all of these are very close to each other. Whereas the difference between convulsions and the life-threatening side effects like hypotension, apnea, and circulatory collapse, the gap is much larger for L-bupivacaine and ropivacaine than it is for bupivacaine. Cocaine also has cardiovascular effects. It inhibits reuptake of norepinephrine. So this excess of norepinephrine causes hypertension and ventricular ectopy. And finally, cocaine, just incidentally, can be given topically, like in the nose, to cause vasoconstriction. And you may see that in, for example, an ENT room. Other organ systems. So in the respiratory system, uh, large serum concentrations of local anesthetic will decrease the hypoxic drive and relax bronchial smooth muscle. Now, allergy to local anesthetics is generally rare. When it happens, it's more likely with esters than with amides, and that's because of the paraaminobenzoic acid. Esters are metabolized to form that substance, and that's a potential allergen. But there are other components that people can be allergic to. So, preservatives that are in the preparation in the vial of local anesthetic can cause allergic reaction, like methylparaben, which is metabolized again into PABA, or different sulfites like sodium bisulfite or metabosulfite, which are used to prevent degradation of vasopressors like epinephrine. If you have a patient who has a history of allergic reaction to local anesthetics and you're going to try a different one, uh, you may want to use preservative free local anesthetics just to minimize exposure to any other foreign substances. And in general, if they're allergic to esters, you may want to switch to an amide. Methemoglobinemia occurs when the iron in hemoglobin changes to a different ionic state. And in this state, it's unable to bind oxygen. This can occur with exposure to large amounts of prilocaine or benzocaine metabolites. It can happen with lidocaine, although less commonly. So when more than 10% of a person's hemoglobin becomes met hemoglobin, their oxygen carrying capacity decreases and they can become short of breath, have cyanosis, mental status changes, headache, fatigue, dizziness, and eventually loss of consciousness. This is more common in patients who have anemia or cardiovascular disease, lung disease, sepsis, or other hemoglobin abnormalities. Uh, those patients are more susceptible to met hemoglobinemia when it occurs. Severe met hemoglobinemia, that is more than 50%, can lead to cardiac dysrhythmias, seizures, coma, and death. The treatment for met hemoglobinemia is methylene blue. That will restore the ionic state of the iron and allow oxygen carrying to happen once again. Now that we've talked about CNS and cardiovascular side effects, we need to talk about one of the most dreaded side effects of local anesthetics, which is LAST, local anesthetic systemic toxicity, where patients have complete cardiovascular collapse due to 
uh, binding of local anesthetics to the cardiac receptors, as well as neurologic sequelae from binding to the CNS receptors. The treatment of LAST starts with airway support, seizure control, and then supportive care of the hypotension and bradycardia, even ACLS protocols if needed. As we will see on the next slide, there are some subtle differences from standard ACLS procedures, and they include limiting the amount of epinephrine given, avoiding local anesthetics like lidocaine, which seems obvious but may be overlooked in a crisis situation, and also limiting, although not avoiding, the use of other supportive drugs like vasopressin, calcium channel blockers, and beta blockers. The mainstay of treatment for LAST is a bolus of intralipid, and these patients may even require cardiopulmonary bypass or ECMO support in order to support circulation until the local anesthetic has been cleared from the body. This flow sheet, which is available from ASRA, the American Society for Regional Anesthesia, diagrams the treatment for local anesthetic toxicity, systemic toxicity. Local anesthesia should always be administered in large doses only in the presence of appropriate rescue medications, and a last rescue kit should be available anytime large volumes of local anesthetic are being used. The treatment of lipid emulsion, or intralipid, is very simple. For patients who weigh over 70 kilograms, we give a 100 milliliter bolus over two to three minutes, which is a rapid bolus, or infuse 250 milliliters over 50, and then infuse and then infuse 250 milliliters over 15 to 20 minutes, with the option of repeating the bolus and doubling the infusion if the patient remains unstable. For patients under 70 kilograms, there is weight-based dosing, as you can see on the slide. Other considerations, as we mentioned before, include management of seizures, which means ensuring adequate airway and a patent airway. Benzodiazepines are the preferred medication for stopping seizures because drugs like propofol may cause hypotension and may impede respirations. But if propofol is the only drug available, low doses of 10 to 20 milligrams at a time would be appropriate, again, to avoid hypotension and respiratory depression. If patients become hemodynamically unstable, standard HCLS should be implemented, again, using a small dose of epinephrine. So instead of the standard one milligram dose, it's recommended to start with up to one microgram per kilogram. We also recommend avoiding, once again, local anesthetics, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and vasopressin. If the patient is stable, the lipid emulsion can be continued and the patient should be observed for at least two hours after seizure and four to six hours after more significant cardiovascular instability. Finally, there's a large chart in your notes that goes over several local anesthetics, but these are probably the agents you want to be most familiar with. Chloroprocaine with a maximum dose of 12 milligrams per kilogram and a duration of about 30 to 60 minutes. Cocaine with a maximum dose of 3 milligrams per kilogram, again, short acting. Those are both esters. Then for amides, we, ha we have bupivacaine or marcaine. Maximum dose of 2 milligrams per kilogram or 3 per kilogram if it's mixed with epinephrine. Duration anywhere from 1.5 to 8 hours, although we'll see longer durations for, say, peripheral nerve blocks. Lidocaine, maximum dose 4.5 milligrams per kilogram or 7 with epi. Duration usually 0.75 to 2 hours. And finally, ropivacaine, 3 milligrams per kilogram and a similar duration as bupivacaine, 1.5 to 8 hours. That wraps up our discussion of local anesthetics. Please contact me or bring your questions to class if you have any. And thanks for your attention.